Hello and welcome to Detroit, Michigan. Now, almost prophetically, the roads in early Detroit back in 1805 were laid out like the spokes of a wheel. Little did the citizens of what was no more than a crude trading post by the river know that this city would become home to the automotive barons and, of course, the home of the motor industry here in America. Last week on Motor Week, we gave you exclusive looks at the new cars and the concept cars. But the show here in Detroit is so big, we're back to show you even more. As a previous owner of a Mercedes-Benz SL300, I always feel a bit of a drool coming on at the promise of Mercedes-Benz launching a new sports car, and I've not been disappointed because the Vision SLA is absolutely gorgeous. It's based, really, Ian, on the SLK, but with bits added onto the outside and bits taken out of the inside. Absolutely. They've done some of the styling from the SLR Vision concept, which was launched a year ago and which goes into production very soon. Now, the SLA is based on the Mercedes A-Class, uses the same floor pan as that. 1.9-litre engine, 125 brake horsepower, 0 to 60 in about 7.5 seconds, so it should be a fantastic car to drive. I'll bet it is. They're calling this the Lotus Elise of the Mercedes-Benz product line, and for obvious reasons reasons, which actually begs the question of where it'll be marketed, certainly against the Lotus Elise, but with the SLK still there in its product lineup, you wonder whether it might be competing against one of its own sister products. Well, it does look very similar. Um, dimensions are, are pretty similar too, about 12 feet long the SLA, but what they've done with the SLK is upgraded it a bit more, put a bigger engine in a 3.2 litre V6 goes in the SLK now. So it's going to be a terrific sports car lineup for Mercedes in the future, hopefully, if this goes into production. SLA, SLK, SLR. The bodywork's made up of two lightweight materials, aluminium and plastic, and the load bearing parts of the body are made from aluminium profiles. And the outer body shell is largely high quality plastic. And because of this, innovative method of construction. The Vision SLA weighs, what, 950 kilograms. It's pretty light, really. Are you going to put one of these in your shopping bag? I've put my order in already. <laughs> Now, if you're wondering what VW's been up to at the Detroit show, well, the answer's not too much as far as we're concerned. The only new vehicle from them is this 4x4 concept called the Advanced Activity Concept, or AAC. It's a 4x4 vehicle. And, of course, North America is such a big market for pickups and trucks. They say this is the sort of pickup, though, that you can take to the opera. Whether you can remains to be seen, and, of course, whether it goes into production remains to be seen, too. But the styling designs and cues from this car will also be seen in the forthcoming Porsche VW Sport Utility Vehicles, which will be out in a couple of years' time. As you know, we are uh, preparing a sports utility vehicle, and we have a certain leadership in diesel engines, and those engines are very different from the diesel experience of, of former times more different from the US experience diesel engines. I think there are a lot of stories. One of the stories is there is a, a sports utility vehicle coming up and another one is there is a totally new diesel story coming. I mean this this car has a torque of 750 newton meter. I mean uh, it's, it's, it's a, a mixture of, of a sedan and a race car. The power plant of the AAC, the Advanced Activity Concept, is a V10 turbo diesel producing 313 brake horsepower. Inside, it features lots of aluminium, six-speed automatic transmission, permanent four-wheel drive, and the design is very smart indeed, nicely rounded. The world and his wife seems to be producing pickup trucks at the moment, and VW is no exception. It's now pretty much obligatory for every car manufacturer to add a 4x4, or in this case an all-wheel drive model, to their range of products. This is Hyundai's Santa Fe. Now, you may remember this as a concept vehicle from last year's Detroit Motor Show. Now, here it is in all its very stylish glory. This perfectly likeable SUV will be available in Britain later on in the year, but it's very unlikely to be called the Santa Fe, so don't ask for it by name. Meanwhile, over here, and coming to Europe much sooner, is this, the Hyundai Coupe. Here they call it the Tiburon, which is Spanish for shark, for fairly obvious reasons at the front. This will be launched in Europe at the end of January, and we'll bring you lots more details then. 
Well, it's good to see one of our old friends from dear old Blighty. Len Hunt, former uh, chief of Audi in the UK, now chief of Audi in America. Good to see you again, Len. Yes, that's right. Send some more Red Cross parcels, please. No, no it's, uh, it's nice to see you. And, uh, and hello back to everybody in UK. And got to say, we're enjoying ourselves out here. So you've been out here just a year. It's, it's your first anniversary. And, and how are things going? Well, I, it couldn't be better. You know, I mean, if you take the uh, the sales figures, um, last year I was presenting. I've only been two days uh, here, but presenting 47,000 cars we'd sold in uh, in North America in 1998. But now we see ourselves at the end of 99 to 2000, we sold nearly 40% up. We had a wonderful year selling 66,000 cars. And uh, I've got to say well done to my old friends in Audi UK because I know they sold 40,000, but it's still nice to be in front of them. But yeah, it was a wonderful year and uh, our colleagues in Canada selling over 5,000 cars. They had a real rock and roll time too. I mean, you presided over fantastic growth throughout the UK and you've really come here to try and do the same to the USA. That's the thing, yeah, because obviously the USA for Audi is one of the major growth areas in the world where you can see significant growth, significant double-digit growth. And what we want to do is carry that tradition on. And uh, boy, we, uh, we did it in 1999. So you've got a good lineup from what the A is the A3 sold in America? No, no, no. We don't see the A3. Actually, it's a very different lineup. When you uh, one of the first things you've got to get used to is things like no A3s, no diesel. Um, you know, and really mainly with the petrol engine cars are, are, are the top the top engines. So we start with the 1.8 T. We don't have a 2.4 liter in the A6. So yeah, it's a very different lineup, and uh, and one that's expanded in. Uh, 2000 model year as we say we see ourselves having the s4 now in america um, and the tt has been launched with wider claim ford have called their concept car this year the 24 7 because from it you can be connected to the entire planet through the internet 24 hours a day seven days a week and that's not all the car can be reconfigured depending on who the driver is so mum dad and the kids can all drive the same car with different designs inside and also different parameters for driving it. And I love these back screen displays here of the, the speed and the internet web access here in the center. You could also use satellite navigation in the future and even email the maps to where you're going to your friends. It's all part of the concept for Ford is not the car this year, it's the idea. It's where we're heading into the future, being connected all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Within a few years, Virtually every car and truck that the Ford Motor Company builds all over the world will have advanced, voice-activated, hands-free telematic systems that will cover a wide range of uh, services. Well, I think a lot of people do share cars and families. And uh, if you have to share a family, wouldn't it be better to be able to personalize it to your own uh, liking? Uh, certainly we're showing three different vehicles. If the family would like to have all three, then we'd be happy to, to sell them those. But we're, what we're trying to show is the flexibility and the modularity of the system. How much research did you do into these sorts of ideas with, with real car owners? We did a lot of it. Uh, we talked to all age groups as well. And one of the things I keep pointing out to everyone is this really isn't a vehicle just for young kids. This is a vehicle for, for modern families. And uh, we, we know that people in their 50s as well as people in their 20s are interested in this type of technology. Now, some people might say that it's just a string of ideas that anybody could say, well, you know, interconnectivity this and email that, sat nav this, you know, change the style. It's easy to come up with these ideas. It's a bit of a sixth form project. But I, I mean, when will we ever see anything like this be? Well, you're going to see immediately, uh, as Jack mentioned, we'll have voice activation uh, immediately in Lincoln. It's coming very, very quickly soon after in Jaguar. Uh, we'll have it in Ford Focus in Europe. And uh, as this projection system that you see running here will be uh, probably in production in the next two years as well. Uh, the Internet, probably three to five years away. The 24-7 idea for a concept complete with its Postman Pat style cars may seem like pie in the sky, but you can bet that the designers here are taking themselves very seriously. I was getting uh, tired of the interiors of cars and how uh, old-fashioned they are in many ways with mechanical buttons. And The, po the point is 75% uh, of the people say they can't do without their computers, so why not get what's right and what works in computers into our cars? And that's what we basically try to do. Once you go to an instrument, instrument panel that is a projection screen, you could project anything you want, whenever you want. You could project a lot. You could project very little. The choice is up to you. And what did you make of it, Ian? Well, it was all very weird. Having just been from a fantastic launch by Chrysler, who showed us four stunning concept cars, 
and it was a brilliant show, well put together, to come here and listen to Jack Nasser, who's the CEO of Ford, witter on for about 10 minutes about something we know all about, e-commerce and all the rest of it. It's hardly cutting-edge technology. That's well, it well, is cutting-edge technology, but, I mean, we already know about it. And what they're trying to say is that it's not about the car here, it's about what you can do inside the car. You can style the interior depending on who's driving, whether it's mum, dad, or one of the kids, uh, and that the style of the driving would also change. You can talk on the internet, you can send maps to your mates, but it sounded a bit to me like a sixth-form project that was ill-conceived. I mean, do you really want to sit in your car and send emails to your friends? I mean, and pick your emails up and do things like that? I mean, it's just, it just doesn't happen happen in the real world. Underwhelming. We're disappointed. It's a thumbs down. Let me ask you a question. Which is the most powerful and fastest Italian sports car ever produced? Is it a Ferrari? No. Is it a Maserati? No. It's a Lamborghini in the shape of the new Lamborghini Diablo for 2000. And this is it, along with a new 6-litre engine, a V12 engine producing 550 brake horsepower. The top speed is over 220 miles an hour. It does 0 to 60 in 3.95 seconds. Previously, the Diablos came with a 5.7-litre V12 engine with 530 brake horsepower, but it wasn't enough. So it's gone up to 550 bhp, along with a completely redesigned interior and cockpit and is a real boy's toy. And you have to be a seriously strong boy to drive one of these cars. Believe me, the driving position is not exactly comfortable. The clutch, the gearbox, very heavy. But it is a real street legal road racer. It's Time out for us here at the Detroit International Motor Show. Join us again in a couple of minutes for more exclusive coverage. This is the Renaissance Center here in Detroit, a huge office and shopping complex, including the tallest hotel in the world, overlooking Canada on the other side of the river. This fortress-like structure was originally proposed by Henry Ford II in response to the rebuilding after the infamous 1967 race riots here. And it's ironic that after falling into decline in the 80s and the 90s, that huge center has now been taken over by General Motors, Ford's arch rival, and is the new GM headquarters for the whole world. So what new cars are General Motors showing here at the show? Well, let's find out. Well, there were gasps of astonishment by the gathered throng yesterday at the show to unveil GM's four concept cars, one of them being this, the Buick LaCrosse, a car personally I think is absolutely gorgeous, and you can see why the crowd absolutely loved it too. It's a luxury sedan, but it also converts into, well, something of a pickup truck because at the press of a button or by voice command, the roof moves across to reveal a large load carrying area at the rear. Under the bonnet you get a 4.2 litre V8 engine as you can see from there and also that very clever side hinged opening bonnet too. It's a shame that cars like this will probably not go into production because this is the sort of car that would attract admiring glances wherever it went around the States. Not the sort of car for Europe though. They also showed us this, an Opel Zafira Snow Tracker, which is somewhat of a gimmicky car to say the least. It is of course based on the Zafira that we know at home and which has been very successful with things like the Flex 7 seating plan. This gets a 2.2 litre engine, it's a little bit bigger than the Zafira that we know at home as well and also offers some things like the flared wheel arches, bigger wheels, there's an integrated roof box in the top there as you can see that you can put your skis into. Now this sort of car you can't honestly see going into production and what the people of Kensington High Street would make of a Zafira Snow Trekker, I'm not quite sure. The Ford Motor Company will be feeling extremely proud of itself here in Detroit because the Ford Focus has been voted North American Car of the Year. In fact, it becomes the first car ever to be European as well as North American Car of the Year. And there are further adventures ahead for the Ford Focus. 
true to their concept ideas for this year that cars in the future will also be communications tools, the Ford's Focus is set to have a system called telematics installed into it. There'll be four buttons on the dashboard which will automatically get you through to emergency services, directory assistance and roadside assistance. In charge of the telematics system is Mike Ledford and I caught up with him earlier. Well, we think it's substantially more useful than a normal telephone. Uh, if you extrapolate out a little bit once it gets fully integrated into the vehicle, if you lock your keys in your car, you can call us up and we can remotely unlock your car for you. You can't do that with a cell phone. If someone steals your car, we could remotely disable it. You can't do that with a cell phone. But probably more important from the safety and security elements of it is that instead of having to look at a little tiny display or have little tiny buttons, we have a much more ergonomic user interface. Consider the radio in your car. You can reach over and with one button change a station. Well, the interface we have on the telematics device on the Focus is with one button you can select from a variety of different services. And the Ford Focus containing the telematic system will be available as an option in the Ford Focus next year. Well, the General Motors array of car brands just seems to grow and grow and grow. As you can see behind me, look at all those impressive badges, all those familiar American names like Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, and their luxury brand Cadillac. But there, for the first time, surely in America, the Vauxhall Griffin badge alongside the Holden badge from Australia and of course Opel from Europe, Saab are there because they're part of the General Motors stable and Saturn which is General Motors budget brand. So despite rumours that the Vauxhall Griffin badge might go in the UK in favour of the Opel brand, well hopefully not because it's up there. But who knows what's the next badge that General Motors will add to their impressive stable. Honda is showing off two concept cars here. This is the first one, the FCX, which is driven by a hydrogen-based fuel cell system. Science, a bit boring really. I'm much more interested in this. It's called the Spocket. It's a sports car with a pocket. Evidently, it's like one of those transformer things, you know, the old robots. It's a three-in-one. It's a sport coupe, a pickup and a convertible. And standing proprietorially by it is the designer Bernard Lee. Let's go and find out what's going on in his head. <laughs> Necessary. Bernard, this is a fabulous looking concept car. What's the idea behind it? This is kind of a West Coast flavor on uh, what youth people might want. And we were thinking that we have such, you know, youth people have so many different activities that they want to do. So we need a car that fits all those different activities also. So we took three different cars, um, a pickup truck, a convertible and a sports car and just kind of all melted it down into one vehicle that kind of suits all their needs. So this is the California of the future, is it? Yeah, you could, you could say that, yeah. <laughs> and who's it aimed at? Young people? Young people that have a really active lifestyle. Like, uh, one day they could have um, go up mountain biking, fit all the bikes into the back area, and then take their ski equipment, put it in there. Um, or they could go to the beach, throw back the top, uh, and they can hose out the interior if they get dirty, you know, not worry about really ruining the upholstery or anything, just a user-friendly vehicle. In fact, Bernard, you've designed this car for yourself, haven't you, really? Uh, you could say that. I, a lot of things on here is something that I've always wanted to have in my own vehicle. <laughs> so, but also to meet other, the general audience also. Okay, it's, it reminds me of one of those old Transformer robots that we used <laughs> to have. In the, put it through its paces, it's quite startling, this. Okay. Um, first, I'll, I'll show you how the, the top root works. Um, it just, this hard top actually just slides back and then kind of sits on top of the rear bed. And what does that turn it into? Convertible. Yeah, of course. So for some open air driving. And the doors, they open scissor type doors. <laughs> this is very dramatic. <laughs> now it's good to see that Land Rover are flying the flag here in America because they've also announced record sales for the US of A for the 1999 model year. Now, last year when we were at the show, we reported how cars like this, the new Discovery Series 2, were selling for roughly about the equivalent in dollars as to what we pay at home in pounds. Yes, $35,000, we pay 35,000 pounds at home. So why aren't prices being aligned when the things are made back in the UK, of course? Latest release from Land Rover tells us that sales here in America are up some 37%. They sold nearly 
30,000 units in 1999 here in America of just the Discovery and the Range Rover series. The Freelander hasn't yet come to America, but it will do when Land Rover introduced their new V6 engine into the Freelander, which we'll also see in the UK later this year. Despite the huge growth in customer choice of SUVs, sports utility vehicles here in the United States, Daimler Chrysler are still throwing money at their top of the range minivans, or what we call MPVs. This is the 2000-2001 Chrysler Voyager, and they say that it's been completely redesigned right down to the lug nuts. Now, when I lived in the UK, I'm happy to admit that I had a Voyager V6 and I was very happy with it too. So let's have a poke around to see exactly what sort of differences they have made. Well, by far the biggest and most dynamic improvement is an electronic key fob which operates all the doors. Tailgate open. And it beats at you to let you know it's about to do that. How about that? Really neat. And uh, tailgate closed. And just in case you have your head in the way, there are lots of sensors around the doors which just send it back up again, so you can't get trapped. Let's move around to the door. Both these sliding side doors operate electronically too, and right here in the middle, there's another good feature. This central console can be moved out or replaced and put in the front of the cab. You can actually move it anywhere so that you can get access up and down the car to clout the kids if they're being too noisy. And the other thing is these just click into place and they're powered so that you can put your phone in or your computer and work here in the back. Nice design. Well, Daimler Chrysler are confident that the market for these MPVs isn't going anywhere in the United States. They sold 600,000 of them last year and they think there'll be as much interest into the future. However, there is some debate about what the market will do in Europe. They told me that they would expect the interest in MPVs to lessen slightly in the future, especially in the light of the mini MPVs like the Renault Megane, where there's far more interest in the smaller version of these cars on European roads. Whenever we come to motor shows, we try and decide which is our favourite car of the show, the real star. And we've had some stunners this week, the Mercedes-Benz Vision SLA concept, the Chrysler concept cars, all four of them, the £250,000 Rolls-Royce Corniche. But for me, it has to be the Jaguar F-Type. It's a stunning car, a car that we hope to see on the roads of Britain and all around the world very soon. And as the post-show party here at the GM Experience gets into full swing, that completes our exclusive coverage of the Detroit Motor Show 2000. And don't forget, there are some excellent links to the official Detroit Motor Show website, and you can find that through our own website, which you'll find at www.gmenmotors.co.uk. But next week, our focus returns to Europe when Ken Gibson drives Citroen's 2CV for the 21st century. It's a budget sub £10,000 car called the Plurial. So join us next week on Motor Week here on Granada Men and Motors.